our services? What does it cost us to have impact? So that we can then ask the other question in sustainability, which is how much impact can we afford to have? The relationship between income and full cost is what every leader needs to know for strategic decision making, regardless of external reporting requirements. How do we build financial literacy within our organizations? So we often talk about sustainability as if it is a destination a utopia that we can go to and uh, money will just flow in year after year. I used to think that was called the foundation, but it doesn't really work that way there either. It doesn't work that way in the for-profit sector either. Anybody remember, you're probably too young, but back in the 80s there was a store called Blockbuster. It used to go down on your Friday night with your Blockbuster card and rent the Karate Kid on VHS. <clears throat> Nobody said back in the mid-80s that Blockbuster wasn't a sustainable business model. Today, there's one Blockbuster left in Anchorage, Alaska. I don't know how that one held on, but that's a whole different <laughs> keynote. Sustainability is an orientation. It is not a destination. What is sustainable is constantly changing. We're having a debate in our country right now about what the role of public funding is in the social service sector in particular. That doesn't mean it was not sustainable 10 years ago, but it doesn't mean it won't, you know, I don't know what it's going to be sustainable 10 years from now. Sustainability is an orientation. It's a good thing. It's partly what drives us for continuous learning to improve our communities and it allows us to move forward. But it's hard and it creates a lot of fear. So we need to recognize that and embrace change and constantly be in touch to understand how it's affecting our business model. That's a lot of work for one person. Which is why the next competency is to bring others along. It's actually just because I like the picture. <laughs> so, you know, we have a challenge in our sector, among many others. So a recent study by Bridgespan talked about the fact that only 30% of nonprofit executives are promoted from within their organization. In the for-profit sector, that's 60%. It's about leadership development. And then when we hire leaders, we still in our country have this mythical image that they're gonna swoop in like Superman or Wonder Woman and solve the day. I know yet, I have yet in my experience to meet an executive director who wakes up on that very first day of work and says, oh my gosh, now I know how to make this organization sustainable. And yet, that's what we seem to look to do. Rather, it takes all of us. We never know where the next great idea for sustainability may come from. The job of a leader is really to convene and to hear. We all have a role to play. While you are here, there's a good chance that somebody is back in your office making a decision which will affect your organization's sustainability. So how do we engage them to hear what they think needs to be done? to hear those who are working with our constituents. This idea of convening, sharing information, listening and exploring together has an added benefit. It creates the next generation of leaders. And that also strengthens our sustainability. To be sustainable, we need to be transparent, we need to share information, and we need to bring others along. When I was a, a CFO, I remember this experience. We were hiring somebody, and um, we, I asked the person, they were running a program for us, and I asked the person, do you know how to read a budget? And the board chair at the time took me out afterwards and said that was an inappropriate question. 
And I thought back afterwards and I said, well, that's funny, because when I was applying to be a CFO, you asked me if I believed in the mission. <laughs> I'm, you know, how can one be and not the other? This person was running a $3 million program. Um, I'm not saying that that would have been a disqualifying question, but I needed to know what, I, what we were getting, where we needed development. Most people, here's a surprise, don't tweet this one out, it's just keep it our secret. Most people don't go into nonprofits because they love nonprofit accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's a pretty important part of our job. So how do we build a culture of financial literacy? How do we make it so that people can make that integrated decision? That is about bringing others along. Just as important as articulating the impact is important as knowing your cost. And we all together need to take the time to do that and to build a team, staff, volunteers, board, who can see that so we can be open to the next decision coming along. See, it's not a one-time thing. Sustainability is not episodic. It doesn't belong to just senior management or just the board of directors. It's really a mindset, a way of organizational being that allows us to explore that intersection of urgency and opportunity in an ongoing and adaptive way. These are small steps that lead towards sustainability. This is the wax on, wax off, paint the fence. Those pieces to move one step at a time and be able to guide our organizations for the capacity to endure. There is no one answer. <coughs> Each of our organizations can be sustainable in a different way. If, especially if, we listen to our community and to our constituents and we align around that. When people understand our impact <coughs> and we are engaging them in an authentic way, they will support and build the organization. This is not an easy task, <laughs> I wish it was. In strategy, we often talk about big audacious goals as moonshots, referring to President Kennedy's bold goal of going to the moon. In his speech, Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The governor spoke a couple minutes ago about how being a governor and the decisions you have to make are hard. We know from our work across the country that nonprofits are facing challenges with revenue streams, with impact, with relevance, it is hard work, and it's not for the faint of heart. But by doing it intentionally, together, one step at a time, just like they did with the moonshot, we can meet our goal. We often think about just the end. But it's all the little pieces, it's all the little steps that we need to build on to make that happen and to work. <coughs> Sustainability is about bringing people together and collectively building community. It may be hard, but the societal need for our work has never been greater. And if done correctly, we're not doing it alone. We're doing it together, having impact, and creating not just the capacity to endure, but the capacity to thrive and to build the type of community that we all want to live in. Thank you very much. I have a couple minutes, three minutes for questions or something, if, if we have one or two, or... Okay, so you all sleep. Oh, thank you.
<laughs> what was the, uh, maybe I missed it, could you talk a little bit more about the embracing the change? Please? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, embracing change is, is an interesting one. I, I worked with an organization, I'll give you this anecdote a little bit. I worked with an organization that um, we had looked at how the community around them had changed. And they were living off of reserves and uh, at that time. And we looked at it and we said, you know, the community has changed, your revenue model hasn't, your organization really hasn't, you're living off of reserves. If you change nothing, how long will this organization survive? Now, they have some pretty good reserves. So, uh, and, and, you know, they, they said about five years was the answer. I said, okay. How many of you think this organization should survive greater than five years? They all raised their hands and looked at me like I was crazy for asking the question. So I said, okay, great. I was pretty proud of myself as a facilitator. I thought we laid the foundation. We can move along now. What can we change? What, when you think about what is one thing that we can change to, to you know, change our trajectory? Over the course of the next three hours, we changed nothing. So, you know, that to me is about kind of that embracing change. It's the recognizing that change does not mean we have failed. Change does not mean we have failed. Change means we need to do things differently. And we have need to have learned from that. We need to have grown from that. And so I think that there are times when people, you know, we, we, get, we get caught up in the minutia and the detail and that we can't necessarily see the bigger picture and or we're just scared because how do we know it will work? Well, I, I tell all my clients in the beginning, I'll t I know one thing, I'm not that smart, I'll tell you that. I know one thing, the status quo of where we are today is not gonna work for an organization in the future. So that is the embracing change. Let's, let's keep this alive and let's keep this, and let's keep this working. And I think that that's a culture. It's not a judgment, it's a learning opportunity. I get what you're saying about finance. Yeah. Help us understand, because we've got nonprofits of all different shapes and sizes. Help us understand how you move from making finance about uh, what an accountant tells you into a part of advancing your strategy, because it's so important and it's a huge leap. I see nonprofits doing it, but it's hard. It's hard work, because people get afraid of the numbers. They get afraid of the red, mm -hmm. and frankly, they should. That's a sobering thing. So, can you can you say a little bit more about how you embrace finance, not be afraid of it, and allow it to work with you, not against you? Well, you're asking a CPA how to embrace finance, so that you know. So, so I might have embraced it a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, so help us. But but I do think this. I, I think that, that there's a there's a there's a piece of it for me that it is about um, uh, there's a couple pieces. Sorry. Um, one is that we we tend at times when we talk about finances in our organizations, I think to get too buried in the details and too in depth into it and. Um, and so I think that that is one challenge that we have, um, that you can still look at it top level without all those details and know kind of what the total cost of your organization is without necessarily knowing depreciation and direct versus direct, all those other fun accountant-like things. But I also think that there's a, there's a tendency um, within organizations to silo the finance and to put the side to put the finance over here and, and part of that is I think by design uh, boards you know you have a finance committee and a, a fundraising committee maybe a program committee and um, and you know the financial statements don't tell you what your what your impact was for that investment and the um, and on the other side you know your, your program evaluation reports really talk about revenue stream so I think it is a little bit about, uh, it's about culture and it's about, which I keep coming back to, I recognize, but, it, and it's about kind of sharing that information, but reminding people how you read them and what this data means. So the, the anecdote I'll give you from that actually comes from my co-author, my friend, Gene Bell. 
Gene, uh, until last month, was the CEO of Compass Point out in San Francisco. And uh, she and I worked together in the finance group out there. And when she became CEO, she decided, since she didn't have the answer to sustainability, she was going to share the finances with everyone. And uh, she said to me, she said it was, you know, those every staff meeting she would have a section where she would go over the finances. Very top level. Here was our revenue. Here were the drivers for that. This is why we worry about X. Here were our expenses. Here's our bottom line. Here's our net assets. This is how much money we have in the bank, right? Um, and she said people started rolling their eyes. And she would do this. She, she was committed to it. She did month after month. And every time people would roll their eyes. And she said finally about month seven, their accountant was on vacation. And so they didn't close the books in time. And they didn't have the financial statement. And she was doing the staff meeting. She hadn't said anything. And about at the end of the meeting, someone said, well, where's the financial statements? How are we supposed to know how we're doing? <laughs> and she thought, ah, wow, now we've created a culture. But this was really about, you know, a lot of people in the organization have purchasing power. So this was really about, you know, how, uh, letting them in on what those decisions were. Whereas, um, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, when I was a staff there before that, we never knew what the finances were. And frankly, we, you know, let's be honest, I was happy not to have to deal with them. But, you know, that isn't empowering and it doesn't bring you as part of it. So, to me, it, it is about breaking down that information. I think it's about how do you even, on the board level, how do you staff your finance committee? I don't think it should all be finance people. Sometimes the best questions from finance committee members comes from those who don't have a financial background. Because I will say, um, on the organization I'm on the finance committee of, I make a lot of assumptions when I look at financial statements. I, you know, it's easy for me to do. And so there is that mix and sharing. Because when you, try, when you say you want to cut the budget by 10%, there's huge implications on program. So we all have a, a joint responsibility to understanding both sides of it. Thank you, very helpful. So one more question. Yeah. Your board source data on boards uh, being lighter was yeah. extraordinarily stunning and sobering. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Delaware, we're fortunate to have Cynthia Primo Martin, who has created Trustees of Color. Mm -hmm. Having said that, diversifying and inclusive boards are so important. Words of wisdom for us so that we don't become this cookie cutter. We need one of them, one of these, yeah. one of these, one of these, one of these, which of course is what what the knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. is, and not the best way to build a board. Having so advice on that oh uh, amen I couldn't I couldn't agree more um, it isn't it isn't about tokenism it's about real real engagement and a lot of that comes we were just talking about this last night a lot of that comes from from building trust and how do you build trust to have real conversations um, uh, in an organization and, and that is um, it's, it's, it's an area where um, I'll be honest I still have a lot to learn on but um, there are, are, are resources out there, and, and it starts with, let's have a conversation. What's the most important thing we're going to do today? It's not approving the consent agenda. It's really talking with each other. Buenos dias, hola a todos. Uh, my name is uh, Ronaldo. Talking about diversity, uh, I wanted to say uh, I represent a newly formed Hispanic American Association of Delaware. Uh, and it's true, we've, we felt excluded from boards here in Delaware. And I think it has a lot to do with um, you guys expecting us to be PhD uh, in order to even consider us. Now, I'm finishing my PhD, but I know I'm one of the few uh, Hispanics here. Now, my question regarding sustainability is, is this. Our constituents, is that the word you pronounce that? <laughs> um, comes from very low income families. And you travel all, all around the world in the United States, and my question to you is, do you have an example of an organization having constituents from very low income families and being able to be financially sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, I, there, I guess, I mean, I think there are examples out there. Um, to me, it, it is having them and equipping them to be advocates for their impact and for the impact of that organization. 
Um, you know, it, it, it needs to be a mix. I think you know, diversity by definition is, is a mix. And so it is about who can be the champion for the cause. And um, you know, there is a, a different, different revenue models. The revenue model doesn't have to be the board members give. I, that is a barrier to diverse board service in a lot of places. Um, and it, but it is about really thinking through that impact and that relevance so that when there are champions that do have resources that can partner with you that are um, that they are experiencing that firsthand um, and being able to do that compass point came out with a story uh, a research report a couple years ago now called bright spots and fundraising and it really is about building that culture of philanthropy and if you read through that actually there's some good examples in there of organizations where it's not about board members writing big checks. It's about movement building. And it's about building people who share your values and having that discussion and then you know keeping up with that and communicating that and finding the champions who can also give resources on that. That's my sign. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>